Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name's Harry from uh, a company called The Secret Police. Is this gonna... Is this thing gonna work? Ah, there we go. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, my name's Harry from The Secret Police. We are a developer in London, a new developer, um, focused on making games for the Western market, but using Japanese game mechanics, um, in particular Gacha, which is, which is what this talk is about, really. Um, so the things I want to talk about is how Gacha is used in Japanese and Asian games, uh, kind of what Gacha is, especially for anyone that doesn't know that. I want to talk about why players like Gacha, um, why it monetizes, why it retains players so very well, um, and some of the things that we can do to apply the, the lessons that we've learned from, from playing and, and in some cases working on Japanese games uh, and apply them to games that we're working on for the Western market. One thing it's not about, um, this talk isn't going to be about targeting Japan. Um, one of the other things I do, I, I run the European office for a, a Japanese publisher called Marvelous. Um, and a lot of time people want to, want to work with us to, to help bring their games to Japan, but it's a pretty difficult thing. Um, and my, my suggestion just on that note is if, if anyone does want to release a game in Japan, it really needs to have worked well in the West first. So don't, although it, it's certainly the case that the Japanese market can be incredibly lucrative, um, if your game isn't monetizing here, it certainly isn't going to do so in Japan. So the way we look at it is, is to split the world into four markets, really. There's Japan, China, Korea, and everywhere else. Um, and everywhere else is kind of, you know, our market. Um, and, and typically, you'd want to succeed in your home market and then license out to a, to a partner in, in all of those territories. So that's all I'm going to say about those markets. Um, one thing I did want to touch on is, is why we're doing what we're doing and how we came to it. So we're, we're building a kind of... Um, collection RPG for, free-to-play collection RPG for mobile. Um, and one of the things we've done for the last couple of years is a lot of data mining of App Store data. Um, I don't know how well you can read this, but this, this is something that we've been running for about two years on the App Store. And we compare the, um, the download charts, the free charts, uh, with, the, with the grossing charts. And the reason to do that is it's very easy to look at the top grossing chart and see it dominated by certain titles. And, and you don't necessarily learn a lot from doing that. But what you can do if you're comparing the, uh, the free chart, the download chart, with the grossing chart, you can see kind of what we call hidden winners. You can see games that maybe are in soft launch or are, um, uh, you know, maybe not super high in the charts in terms of grossing, but actually on a per user basis are phenomenally high grossing. So if you look at this, this is as of last month, um, the top grossing uh, games on a per user per, per install basis um, in the North American chart. And what you can see is there's a load of games in the RPG category there. Uh, and the vast majority of those are using gacha mechanics. Um, so even though you might not have heard of some of those games, uh, on a kind of per user basis, they're, um, they're, they're phenomenally successful. And the reason that that matters, obviously in, you know, in, in mobile, it's become apparent that user acquisition has become phenomenally expensive, um, dominated by games like Game of War that have super high monetization. And, and our view was that you know, if, if you're trying to build a game and you're not targeting a game that's going to have a super high LTV, then really user acquisition as a, as a marketing method is, is closed off to you. Um, you know, it, it, unless you can be in a situation where you've got a game that hopefully has an LTV higher than your cost per acquisition, then there's not really a business model that says you can market that game. So you know, we, we, we pretty firmly believe that people need to be looking at these kind of mechanics, understanding them, and, and, and not necessarily copying everything about them, but understanding why it is that these mechanics work in Asia and what we can learn from those for, for our own titles. So the word gacha, um, it's, it's become, I, I'd never heard this word before I started working in mobile, um, but it's been around in Japan a long time. These are actually some photos I took at Biarritz Airport um, a couple of weeks ago on holiday, and I was surprised to see this, but, but the word gacha is, is stuck all over these machines, and it comes from, comes from the, 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 the machines that are very, very popular in Japan, where you put in a coin, and out comes a little plastic egg that's got some kind of mystery gift in it. You don't know what you're getting. Um, and a gacha is actually the sound of that machine uh, as it kind of spits out the, the egg. It's, it's just kind of gacha, gacha kind of sound. And that, that, that's what people mean when they say gacha. That's where it's come from. Um, and at the heart of it is that kind of exciting surprise of, of, of not knowing what you're getting. You're putting some money in, you're getting something cool. Maybe you're someone who likes to collect these things, and, and you know, your goal is to build up a collection of all the things that you've got through the gacha. So that's, that, that's the derivation of gacha. Um, it's kind of you know, about collecting things that you're hunting down and finding at random. Um, and one of the things about collection is apparently one in three people in the, on the planet collect something. 
Um, you know, people might collect stamps, people might collect coins, people might collect cards, they might collect toys, they might stand there on train platforms and write down the numbers of the trains that come past. All kinds of things that people want to collect, but it seems to be psychologically a thing that an awful lot of people want to do. Um, there's a bunch of reasons why. Psychologists kind of come up with all sorts of dark reasons why it might be um, from, you know, kind of primal desire to collect things, to surround yourself with things, to sort of sense of security, to build your own world, to sort of curate your your own, uh, your, your, your own content and express your personality through that. Um, th th there's the idea, really, that, that a collection can be valuable. Um, it's a key reason why a lot of people say that they collect things. Um, but actually, if you, if, if you talk to your autograph hunters, 90% of autograph hunters, even though they, they consider their collections to be valuable, say that they never plan to sell that collection. For a lot of people, there is just a sense of completion um, of sets and of subsets. You know, if, you, if you're collecting uh, uh, stickers or even in a game like Monopoly, you know, one of the satisfying moments in Monopoly is when you've collected all three or all two uh, all roads of the same colour. There's that kind of, obviously it gives you an advantage in the game, but there's also just that psychological um, buzz that you get from, from completing a set. And that's one of the things that we see quite a lot in gacha games is not just collecting stuff, but giving the player kind of rewards along the way where they, 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 they've created some kind of subset and that, that, that kind of gives them an immediate, immediate sense of achievement. There's rarity. Rarity is super important in, in gacha and in, in, in collecting generally. You know, people love the idea that this thing, I mean, when, when I was a kid, people used to collect stamps and there's a stamp in the UK called the Penny Black, which was the most valuable stamp that you could get and it was super rare. Um, and you know, we, we, even though I, I never personally collected stamps, everyone knew about this. It was kind of the thing that would be incredibly exciting to own. And there's also your personality. You know, the, the idea that you're you're creating and curating and organising, cataloguing, displaying your own stuff. And, and when, you, when you apply that to a game, uh, you know, if it's a game where you're you're collecting characters, where you're using those characters in some kind of battle or, or, or whatever. Um, a big part of the, the interest for players in that is, over time, they're kind of building their own set of characters and, and their own unique play style. And they, you know, that if you, maybe a game like Magic the Gathering, some players will want to play with a certain kind of deck, others will take another in. And it, you know, there's, there's a big element of people expressing their own personality through these. And in some cases, kind of showing off what it is that they've got. So the best collection games make a big thing about being able to, to, you know, to show other people your collection, to, to kind of boast about it, and, and to work on creating the optimum form for any given, any given battle or any, any given quest in the game. So, in, in terms of the structure that these games tend to have, usually they're very, very simple to start playing, which I, th I think is, is, is super important in most mobile games. Um, you know, it, it's well known on mobile, you've got a few seconds to grab the player's attention, and if you don't, the, the, the players are going to drop out very, very quickly. Um, but it's also the case that a game that's, that's kind of fun and, and, and addictive quickly isn't necessarily also a game that people need to play in the long term. It's that kind of difference between you know, immediate gratification and, and long-term mastery that, that uh, really needs to be well balanced in a, in, a, in a mobile game that wants to have longevity. Um, so, so typically the games you know, will, will be super easy to start, but then there's a very much deeper long-term meta game that needs to be mastered by players. And that meta game uh, usually involves games of chance. There's some kind of random element to it. Um, usually, the, the successful Japanese games, they all have these collectible items, desirable collectible items that uh, somehow feed back into the game loop. And you know, having those characters, upgrading those characters, is, is, is a crucial part of, of success in the game. And getting that feedback loop right uh, is absolutely critical in these games. And the final thing which I'll touch on on the end is, is live events, which I think the Japanese developers do better than anyone else in the world. Uh, Western Studios are starting to get it. Um, but just in terms of the amount of uh, kind of person hours focus that goes into live events in Japan and increasingly in China and Korea um, and really is, is, is absolutely key and I'll, I'll touch on that at the end. Um, so in terms of these games being simple to start playing, I've, I've got two Japanese games, they're probably the two biggest and most well-known Japanese games, even though they're not super big in, in the state, sorry, in, in, the, in the West. First one's Monster Strike from Mixie. Um, probably the highest grossing game in the world, uh, even though nearly all its revenue comes from Japan. And the second one's Puzzle and Dragons. Um, and for those who haven't played it, uh, Monster Strike basically plays like a pinball game. Um, you, you have various units you're taking into battle and you, they, they get flipped with a kind of uh, slingshot type mechanic. Very easy to understand. Um, 
pretty much everyone knows Puzzle and Dragons is, is, is a kind of uh, color matching game. Um, but both games under the surface are really identical. They've got completely different battle mechanics, they feel completely different, but the meta game is pretty much identical. Um, obviously, the, the, the most recent um, big successful Western equivalent would be Clash Royale. Um, again, it's really quick to start understanding. You, know, you, you don't need a, a tutorial to understand this game. You're straight in, you know what you're doing. But again, over time, maybe to a lesser extent than the Japanese games, but the card collection aspect of it, the upgrade paths that the cards go through, the, um, the chess system in Clash Royale, comes pretty close to doing some of the things that the Japanese games do. And it does it in a very accessible way, um, which I think is what, you know, one of the reasons why it's been so successful. But the long-term play is, is really more important. You know, almost, almost no matter what the, the sort of sizzle at the start of the game was, it, it's almost like that, that game part is, is the marketing hook beyond the App Store page that you know, gets players involved in the process long enough that the metagame complexity and sophistication and depth is, is exposed to the player, and that hooks them. And it's that metagame that, that, uh, that really in engages and monetizes players for the long term. Because... If you look at a lot of the Asian games, and in fact our game does this as well, it's got an auto battle mode, um, which you don't see in many Western games. So, you know, if someone's bored of playing the, the action game or the puzzle game or whatever it is, you know, eventually players may not want to do that. And what you don't want to do is if people are bored of this part of your game, that they also get bored of that part of the game. So, you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the games do that, and it's actually kind of fun once you are into playing. Uh, uh, the, the, the sort of metagame part, building up your squad, building up the strategy that your squad is going to take into a certain mission, then letting that game play out on its own is actually just as much fun as it would be sort of making those individual turn-by-turn -turn decisions. Um, Clash Royale does it differently, it doesn't auto-battle really, it, um, it just transitions you very, very quickly into player, player versus player, or, or, you know, immediately once you're, once you're through the tutorial or into that player versus player game. And again, PvP is a great way of bringing longevity to uh, what is arguably a sort of relatively shallow um, single player action experience that you see in most of these games. Um, but you know, usually we, we do see that Western games lack the, the, quite the level of sophistication of metagame. Um, we've seen quite a few companies that have, have tried to copy some of the, the Japanese games. Um, and they, they've usually done one of two things. They've either copied them very slavishly, um, and, and in some ways the Japanese games don't work great when you bring them over to the West, because they make a lot of assumptions about player behavior and player understanding. They kind of, you know, Japanese players have been playing these kind of games on, on feature phones for 10 years, um, and a lot of the mechanics that are second nature to Japanese players are pretty new to Western ones. So you you can't just take the game and, and plant it straight over and expect to see the same success. But at the same time, what we've seen is if you dumb down these games, if you kind of uh, you know, make a game that looks like Puzzle and Dragons but actually lacks some of that metagame depth, those games tend not to monetize anywhere near as well. So you, you, you kind of need to get the best of both worlds, the simplicity and, and on-ramp of, of a Western game, but combining that with, without losing any of that depth. Games of Chance, as I said, is, is really important in these games. Um, some people in, in, in Western studios, particularly if I found this in the UK, just don't like the idea of using games of chance in, in um, games. They feel that the, you know, skill is, you know, the, the kind of tactile skill that you might require to play a console game really is the gameplay. Um, I disagree with that. I think if you play, you know, an awful lot of popular board and card games have an element of game of chance to them. You, you wouldn't want to play Monopoly where you always move the, you know, three squares each time, you always know where you're going to land, take away the element of chance in that game, and actually it's a much less interesting experience. Same would be true of poker or all kinds of other, all, all kinds of other games. So, so you know, the, the, the element of chance not only sort of brings a, 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 a mechanism that drives the player forward, it, it also, to an extent, can level out players. If you're not incredibly uh, physically skillful at a game, then the element of chance in that game can make it more interesting for you. And just because a game's using chance as, as a game mechanic, it doesn't mean that there's no skill. Um, Puzzle and Dragons is a very skillful game. It's, it's actually very easy to, to make a match in Puzzle and Dragons. And once you're reasonably good at it, you can pretty much clear the board every time. But the skill in Puzzle and Dragons, which is sort of exposed to the player over time, is not about completing those puzzles. It's about working out which squad you need to be taking into the battle, which battle, uh, you know, which baddies you're going to come up against. It's about uh, evolving your squad over time. Um, and so, you know, some players like some kind of skill, some players like others. But, but typically, these games, the skill is uh, in, it sort of slowly exposed to the player through the meta game. Touching again on, on, on set completion, um, this is show. This is the last time I collected anything, and it shows how old I am. Um, this is a football sticker album um, from a company called Panini in the UK, and. 
it, it basically used the gacha system. You know, you'd buy a packet of, of stickers. Um, I think they used to get three or four stickers in a pack. Um, some of them would be, would be players. Some of them would be players from teams that were, were lower down the lower down the, uh, the rankings and weren't particularly exciting, but occasionally you'd get a silver badge. Uh, and if you got a silver badge, particularly if it was for a team that you supported, Brighton and Hove Albion there, then um, that was really exciting because you knew it was rare, it looked special. Um, and the other thing that these sticker albums gave you was the ability to complete a subset. Um, so, you know, it was satisfying to complete a whole team. It was also satisfying just to get the, you know, one page completed or to get a line of players. All of those things kind of gave you that uh, mini goal along the way. I, I suspect nobody ever filled out their whole book. But, you know, just completing a team or completing a page gave you that, that sense of, of achievement and made you continue to want to, to drive forward. Uh, and similarly, in, if you look at a game like Puzzle and Dragons, you can't buy rare items for cash. It, 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 it's not about saying, um, you know, a football sticker album would have been no fun if I could just go and say, OK, I want this player, now I want that player, now I want that player. The, the excitement was in the surprise, was in hunting down things, was in swapping cards with your friends. Um, and so what Puzzle and Dragons does, you, you can win rare characters by completing dungeons. You typically see that. You, you know, players can uh, effectively grind their way through all the content if they want to. Or they can use the Gacha system, which is, you know, uses a cash purchase and gives them a random rare character. And what Puzzle and Dragons does is, is you know, on top of that, it gets you thinking strategically. So the Gacha system, has a, you, you, you can store a limited number of monsters. Um, and because you've got a limited amount of space, then players start to develop their own preferences. They'll start to think, OK, well, this, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to dispose of this unit, or I'm, gonna, I'm going to turn it into something else, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and that, what that does is start, it starts sort of slowly in, including the player into the metagame, making those strategic choices, which are going to be important for them as, they, uh, as we want them to be retained in the longer term. It's very important that these collectibles are desirable. Um, you know, if, if you're going to make a game, typically in Japan, it, it kind of changes by territory. In Japan, the, the rule of thumb is if you're going to launch a collection game, you need something around 300 to 400 characters day one launch. Um, and that number can go up very quickly. If you look at a game like Brave Frontier, it's up to around 1,000 or more characters now. Um, it's been, been running successfully for a very long time. In China, they tend to have less. You might launch a game with 100 characters, but those characters would be upgradable in more ways. So you typically, like a Chinese game, you might collect a character and then equip it with weapons or armor. Um, two different systems. Um, both of them work very well. But the, in terms of the collection psychology, the, the, the sort of large number of collectibles it seems to be the, the, the most uh, the, the, the highest monetizing for certain players. So they've got, to, they've got to be attractive, they've got to progress with players. You want players to think that they're taking their characters on a journey. Um, so, you know, a character that might start off relatively weak and ordinary looking, you know, if, if, if you take that character through the game, it needs to be powered up, it needs to look cooler than it used to. And they need to give you definitive in-game benefits. You know, it's, it's, it's all about getting that feedback loop where I've got these cool characters, I like having these cool characters, but every time I get a new one, that's somehow giving me something new in terms of gameplay. It might just be, you know, that character's got really powerful stats, it might have some kind of move that it can do that you haven't seen before, but by, uh, it, 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 much like a game like Magic the Gathering, you know, every card can have a rule printed on it that kind of you know, it, it increases the, the variety of the game world, and that's one of the great things about a collectible character game is that you can, you can constantly be adding more gameplay and emergent gameplay as, you know, relationships between characters working together or characters in certain places or against certain baddies starts to become a big part of the, the experience. Um, and, and you need to have a variety of functionality. There's got to be a real reason why I'm going to choose this character instead of that character. Not just visual, but real gameplay benefits so that, again, my play style becomes what I'm doing. Uh, and as I said, you need lots of them. So this, this is actually uh, some graphics from our game. Um, we've never showed anyone on this before. Um, but this is to illustrate a couple of the key mechanics um, that you see in, in pretty much all Japanese and the majority of Chinese and, uh, and Korean games. So. On the left there, I've got a couple of weak characters. Um, typically, you, you should get to the end of a quest in our game. You would have uh, some kind of loot drop. You might get given some, uh, some items that can be crafted into things you'll take into battle, or you might get given some, some fairly weak characters. And you can take those into battle themselves, and they're, you know, they're, they're relatively good early on in the game. But ultimately, what you'd want to do is fuse them into one of your cooler units. So every time you fuse the kind of wasted or the, the, the unwanted characters into a, into a better character, then that character's stats will go up. Um, it will become more powerful itself. Um, and that's really good. Fusion is a great mechanic for 
for a gacha system. One of the things you want to avoid is um, disappointing players. You know, players, if, if player is spending money to, uh, to get something through a gacha system, or even if they're just grinding for it, they don't want to feel that something they've got is no longer of value. Um, so by, by making anything, uh, any, anything that the player no longer wants can be fused into something else, you're, you're always giving value. So what, no matter what you give to the player, even if they've already got it, or even if it's not very powerful, it can be used for something. Uh, with, with a, with a uh, fused character like that, when it reaches the maximum amount of, uh, of XP or whatever, whatever uh, uh, stat you're using, um, then typically you would evolve it into something else. And it, it might take, uh, uh, early in the game, you might, you know, you might uh, be able to evolve something very quickly, but as the game progresses, typically you need a, you know, a longer and longer grind or more and more fusion going into one of these things to evolve it to the next level. Um, and, and an evolved character typically looks cooler. Uh, usually what you see, especially in Japanese games, is it's actually initially weaker than it was before it was fused, um, but has a much higher potential. So, you know, the, the, the power of a character kind of goes up and up and up and up, then it dips down as you evolve it, then it goes up and up and up and again. Uh, and, and by the time you've got a kind of maximum evolved character, it just looks absolutely amazing and it's incredibly powerful. And, and certainly in terms of things like player versus player battles, um, you know, seeing players taking in super evolved characters is, is very aspirational for other players. It's great for players to see, well, you know, I've got this, I've got this character, but if I keep going with it, it's going to become that. It's, it's just a really nice mechanic for people to kind of see that, that future path for their squad. And the best free-to-play games are, are really deep. Um, I, I can't really get into any detail on this, but I really strongly advise you, if you are interested in these kind of games, play things like Brave Frontier and Puzzle and Dragons. They, they, they are quite hardcore to get into. Um, and, and you kind of have to persevere. Um, but what you often find is once someone has persevered beyond a fairly uh, complicated user interface, that they, they do get hooked on them. And that, that's certainly what we found when we started investigating this genre. Um, and if you just read up, you know, read up the wikis that fans have made on these games, you'll start to appreciate the complexity that is in those mess games. And the last thing I want to talk about is live events. This is absolutely key to, to these kind of games. Um, it gives players a reason to come back. So, uh, and, and what we find is in gacha games in Japan, they're the biggest driver of any kind of monetization. So that graph there is it's basically a, a graph of, of a Japanese game, I won't say which one, um, showing revenue over time. And those spikes represent about a tenfold increase in revenue on a given day. Uh, and they are all live events. So a live event would be something like saying, you know, if, you, if you play on this dungeon on this day, then you've got a much better chance of winning this character, or this, this kind of character is only available at this time. Um, so yeah, an event is basically something that only happens now, and it might not be repeated for another week or another month, and there's often a really cool rare reward that you get with that. You might adjust the odds, you might be able to say to someone, okay, well, you, know, you really want this character, and if you play this game on Tuesday, then we're going to give you a hundred times more likelihood of getting that cool character through a, a gacha system. And there's all kinds of things that you see in these games, um, but they, they're all designed to kind of make the player want to play now and give them a reason to come back at some point in the future. And depending on what characters a player is collecting or what stage they're at in the game, then they will have different, uh, you know, different events that they want to attend. Uh, also look at, uh, particularly in Chinese games, things called VIP systems where certain players, maybe, maybe the high rollers or the, the, the most advanced players, have access to certain events that others don't. That's a great way to, to continue to, you know, to make players feel special, to really um, you know, make them want to, to continue with your game instead of, instead of uh, leaving for something else. And lastly, yeah, really play these games. Um, but don't try and copy them. They're not directly uh, bringable over, these mechanics, but there's certainly the, the, the spirit and the structure, I think, is very... Uh, very, very useful to understand. And things you should try and identify, you know, what is it about your game that's going to make someone want to play it in a few seconds and, and you know, hopefully keep them playing for a few days. And while, they, while they're into that game for a few days, what is it that you're now exposing to them? What is the depth? What's the, uh, what's the longer term thing that's going to make them think, okay, this wasn't just a cool game for me to play for half an hour, this is something I'm still going to be playing in six months' time. Um, and think about where the skill is in your game. Is your skill just in a, in a is, is it a physical thing, or is there a more, a deeper skill? Is, is there a kind of mastery that's going on? Um, is the player building up their own collection, whether it's a, you know, building a world, building a collection of characters, or whatever it is, what is the player doing uh, and, and gaining in the long term that they're gonna be proud of, that they're gonna want to show other people, uh, that they maybe wanna, gonna want to share with other people through guilds or whatever? Um, 
I don't think this applies to all games, um, but think about would your game still be fun if it was auto-battled? Um, you know, if, it wasn't, if, it, if you think it wouldn't be, if, if the, the battle part of your game or the puzzle part of your game is the whole game, then think about what could you do? Could you, could you use that to build a meta game that would still be fun if you stripped out the original game? And if you can do that, if you can build a meta game and a core loop that is fun without the game, then I think you're a long way to making a game that's going to monetize and retain really, really well. So that's it. Thank you. That's our game, Dragon's Watch. Thanks, Harry.